Did cavemen carve moving pictures into rocks? Welcome to Answers News for May 2nd, 2022. I'm Brian Osborne, that's Rob Webb and Tim Chafee, and this is Answers News, a biblical commentary on the social scientific issues of our day. We are so glad you're here, but before we get into the whole rock carving thing, let's first look at a really stinking flower. All right. <laughs> What a great intro, right? Yeah. All right, but Michigan School's corpse flower blooms for the first time in seven years. So this is a very special sort of flower that blooms very rarely, obviously, once every seven years at this mm -hmm. rate for this flower. It's over in Grand Valley State University over in Michigan. And they say, they say when it blooms, it emits a really foul odor. Uh, they actually equate the odor to that of rotting flesh. So not the best flower for Mother's Day. Okay, just throwing that yeah. out there. Yeah, Mother's Day around the corner is not what <laughs> right. you want to buy. Might be a good breakup flower. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This relationship the is dead. Yeah. Day yeah. Flower, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this one is it, a very rare bloom. In fact, they talk about how the first time can usually take about 10 years, and many times it's more than that for successive blooms. And this this one, uh, it was the first time that they that the school they saw it bloom, but um, they didn't get it when it was brand new, so it might have been more than just the seven years. Um, imagine waiting that long for something. For that. For that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's take this yeah. in. Let's get a good whiff of yeah. this. It'll be another yeah. seven years. Really? Is <laughs> that can really? Can you imagine that? They're just sitting there. Like, oh, I didn't think it was going to be this bad. <laughs> Bottle it up and sell it. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And oh in case goodness. you're wondering, if you watch the video, they explain why it has such that odor. Uh, apparently, it attracts certain pollinators like flies and beetles. So... There, there you go. It does have a function. Yeah. It has so a function. they use it for their Valentine's Day and everything. Yeah. They do. They, oh, they, they like go. it. Yeah, yeah good on you. Yep. All right, that was our fluff piece for the day. Moving on to the other news, the one Tim actually introduced a second ago. Prehistoric people created art by firelight, a new research revealed. Prehistoric. So, as we said in the last show, there's no such thing as prehistory. We have yeah. history from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. found it in his word. So there's no such thing as prehistory. Man runs around on day six, so there's... Five days before man. And um, God. And God told us what happened during those days. He yeah, did. So there's no, right. so, from a biblical worldview, there's no such thing as prehistory. Mm, That's right. Not at all. And so the whole article is about how they're learning how these old humans, back in the day, they're saying roughly 20,000 years ago, they're amazed at how they can do art. And they're doing it by firelight, evidently, based on the markings of the stones and kind of the what's happening during the course of them being etched and carved. They're by mm -hmm. fire. There's remnants of that on the stones themselves. And they're kind of astonished. Oh, man, these people they're almost like real humans. They do art by light. Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that would be tough for somebody like me who cannot even draw a stick figure very well. I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah. But um, are we surprised? Are we shocked yeah. that people can do creative things? No, because people have always been able to create a thing because we are made in the image That's of right. our creator. And therefore, we can do those types of things. Um, and it's, I think they're really shocked that people could use fire to, I mean, you can you can see the evolutionary worldview, the mindset. That if you've seen the different TV shows, like where people were scared by fire, or all that. No, people have yeah. been intelligent from the very beginning. Yeah. But yeah. this this article, you can just continually see the the evolutionary storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um, what was interesting to me is that it, it's not the idea that they're taking a torch up to the cave wall and doing that. It seems like it's something that they had, you know, the fire going in the campfire, then they had your your stones around it. But then they would bring these other ones called plaquettes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. up near it and then they're doing their sketches but because of the way the shadows move and everything the flickering the light that's where you that's why they're recognizing that it must have been done by the mm -hmm. fire and so pretty interesting yeah really that's that's the burning question to consider here no okay uh. <laughs> Would you wow. say this, this research is lit? <laughs> I was waiting for the lit reference. I, I saw your note. I was going to say lit in here somewhere. That. That's what the, all the uh. young kids say, right? But, <laughs> Who yeah, gave I, him a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist. I can't. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, like, like Tim was saying, it's this whole narrative, this evolutionary worldview narrative that says, you know, these so-called prehistoric ancient uh, cavemen, you know, they were... They just didn't have enough intelligence. They weren't smart enough back then. So that's why they're so perplexed and so wondering how could they be, you know, finding food and water and have the time to then create art as well. You know, it's just so fascinating to them. But from a biblical worldview, that makes perfect sense, right? From from the very beginning, Adam was was very intelligent. He had, you know, probably way way smarter than all, all three of us combined. That's um, well, we have an exhibit on that on the Ark Encounter mm -hmm. on deck three called Ancient Man, where we highlight mm -hmm. some of the amazing things that are that are ancient ancestors did that we we look yeah. at and we kind of still marvel too like how did That's they right. how did they do that yeah and it wasn't aliens yeah. it was well, not aliens not this time no. <laughs> well not according to the discovery channel but right yeah yeah no the history channel. history channel history, history channel is half ufo channel. aliens it stuff. is oh. yeah it's right history anyway. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 
Moving on cool from stuff, that, this is an intriguing segue to former stripper running for Congress. Uh, says climate emergency partially prompted decision to get an abortion. Yeah, this one was a doozy. And this, uh, I did, we didn't make up the title. That's the literal title. Mm-hmm. So uh, this woman, who was formerly a stripper, she's d- indeed running for Congress. Her name is Alexandra Hunt, I believe. And uh, so she's... the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia area. And basically all her ideas are very much a left-leaning uh, ideas, kind of pushing those sorts of causes, all for so-called man-made climate more change. More than left-leaning, I think very far Maybe left. falling off the yeah. edge. Yeah, yeah I'm being is, nice in my wording. Yeah. And uh, oh, we'll definitely see that. And of course, climate yeah. change is a climate emergency in her ideology. And she gives a whole kind of justification in this article about how or why she committed abortion. Because, well, of the bad state of the world and the climate emergency that we live in, they want to bring a kid into that. So instead of bringing her child into this world to live in these rough conditions, she decided to murder her child in her womb, which was obviously a much better option, right? No. It, it always surprises me how people will justify things like that. It's one thing, you know, we, we see this really with young people today. They're so terrified of the world, of what's going on. And there are terrible things going on in the world. Let's not yeah. uh, kid ourselves. We know that there is evil out there. Uh, there's evil all around because there's people, and people are evil. That's right. But it's um, world. it doesn't mean that that it's so completely unsafe that a, that a child can't survive. I mean, millions, hundreds of millions of them are surviving and doing well, but um, it, it, so it's really sad. The whole story said she's very um, open about it. In fact, she's proud about it based on the the slogans of the, the shirts that her campaign is having. Um, mm-hmm. But the one thing I wanted to, to bring up, um, she talked about doing that that as her profession part time during college to help raise money, you know, earn money. Mm-hmm. Um, and she says this: I think that to fail to fall silent on a community that is so marginalized is harmful. And she's talking about sex workers, which uh, oftentimes can include people who are doing many things illegal, but but it can include young people who are mm-hmm. taken into this lifestyle. So I think mm-hmm. we, as Christians, we need to have a, a tenderness, a, a soft spot in our heart for people who are trapped in this sort of thing, or who are who are involved in this sort of thing. And uh, there is a way out. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, he can he is willing to forgive those who, who turn to him, who, who place their faith in him. And so we need to share the good news with people who need to hear it. And uh, that's from pe- some people who we might consider to be the, the lowest of the low in our, in our society sometimes. But they're human beings made in God's image. They're worth pursuing. And no one's beyond God's reach. Right. right? Absolutely. We are all sinners before yeah. a holy God. And when, anytime he saves us, it's a supernatural work, no matter who you are. And so God can reach anyone. The hardest mm-hmm. atheist can be changed in a moment by the power of God through mm-hmm. his word and through the gospel so we shouldn't give up hope right. and the answer as Tim just said is the gospel and we need to recognize that gospel is rooted in the truth of God's word so we mm-hmm. should unashamedly proclaim the truth of God's word in all things whether we're talking about sexuality or gender or origins salvation declare that truth and through that truth through his word through his spirit he does amazing things for his glory and so we should engage these people with that truth and she needs it yeah. she is so yeah. deceived she made a statement yeah. about her abortion she said the decision was made with a lot of of love. For who? For who? Well, for herself. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. But it shows how deceived she is. And by the way, in our sin, we're all deceived like that. Again, she needs the gospel is what it boils down to ultimately. She needs that heart of the stone transformed in the heart of flesh. And that's the good news of the gospel, like Tim was saying. You know, so we should continue to be praying for Alexandra here. Um, Miss Hunt, you know, that, that she, she would repent. She would turn turn to Christ, you know, as well. But this is just more evidence we're living in the culture of death today, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're seeing this all around us with sexual morality, with abortions left and right and center. But really, this is just symptoms of a culture that has rejected God's word, right? So it's it's really, that's, that's what it comes down to. Is it God's word or is it man's word, right? If we go back to God's word, we know all children are made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. And from they're like from the moment of fertilization, moment of fertilization, yeah. from that very day zero, of that moment, that child made in the image of God is worthy of protection and valuable mm-hmm. because of God's word and because of God's word alone. But I, I wanted to point out something here because this is something you hear a lot from the pro-death community over and over again. They always say, you know, when I become ready uh, to become a mother, you know, she says, as far as my abortion, I was 18 and was not able or ready to be a mother. But here's the thing, she doesn't stop being a mother when she has an abortion. She's simply a mother of a dead child. And that's why we need to be praying for her, Mm -hmm. praying for anyone else that's 
contemplating killing their child, you know, that they would turn away, that they would let their baby live and give God the glory. You know, we've got a beautiful exhibit at the Creation Museum called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. So those of you who have already been there, you've, I think you've seen it. Um, and it's, it's done. There's a, there's, a there's a good book. The writing in that is spectacular. Um, <laughs> no, who did the writing again? <laughs> uh, some tall, bald guy. guy but, uh, it's <laughs> a little <laughs> truth reading. It, but it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful exhibit, beautiful book too. Yeah, um, yeah and it's really done, good images and pictures. And, and, and it's done yeah. very sensitively because it is a sensitive issue. And yeah. we're gonna, we've had right. women go through who have, um, who have yeah. made the decision at some point to uh, abort their child. Mm. And, um, and so we knew we needed to approach this in, in a very sensitive way. Um, but we're also we're updating these. Well, that's not the right. We're creating a permanent exhibit that's going to be about double the size. Um, that's under construction right now at the Creation Museum. So that is coming in the not too distant future. And uh, real quickly before we get to the next one, Rob, uh, notice the, the wording that you used. You didn't call them pro-choice. You called them pro-death. I did. Because yeah. what happens so often is they control the terms of the debate. They, mm -hmm. they call themselves pro-choice. Hey, you're positive. It's something, you're for something. Who doesn't want to be for choice? Yeah. Well, what's the choice? To, they want to be allowed yeah. to put their child to death. And we are anti-abortion. No, we're, we're pro-life. Mm -hmm. right. So notice how the terms are used. So right. yeah. it's a good nice point. job slipping that in there. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, that's just one of the things you always hear a lot. And that's ultimately one of the downfalls is they try to use our American liberty, you know, because everyone wants choice, everyone wants autonomy of that, that kind of thing. So that's why they kind of slip that in there. But really, we can't be using that, that those types of terms. We need to call it what it is. It's pro-abortion, it's pro-death, and that's, that's what, what we got to call it. Absolutely. And then speaking of that and fighting against these bad ideologies, next article, Kentucky legislature overrides Bashir's veto bill on abortion or veto on the abortion bill. Uh, shutting down basically abortion, facility, abortion facilities for just a little bit until this was taken there back. There are to two court. of them in the state of Kentucky. Two in Kentucky. Yeah. This Down was good news Louisville, initially, right? So the legislature overrode uh, Bashir and vetoed that particular bill, which was a good thing. But then what happened next after that? Yeah, I was just kind of trying to follow along, and apparently there was a temporary restraining order, so that's no longer the case anymore. But basically, this, this law had three components in it. The first part was a 15 week ban. Um, which, of course, is just, just, just an arbitrary number because we know from life begins at the moment of fertilization. It's not at 15 weeks. Um, the second part was it requires women to see a doctor prior to receiving a chemical abortion pill. And then the third one was there's these new reporting requirements on these abortion mills, and apparently they couldn't comply with it. They were unclear, and so they brought it to court, and then the judge then granted them a temporary restraining order. So they are back in business. They are in, in the business of killing um, innocent children every single day. And I believe the two mills are in Louisville right now. So, um, yeah, we just need to be praying for, as well as for this nation to turn away from this wickedness, this evil that's really just plaguing our, our land today. And, and really, we shouldn't be regulating murder. We should be seeking to end it. We should be seeking to abolish it completely. Well, one of the things, think about how common sense this is. Um, part of the bill is... Um, the, that they were ob objecting to, you know, the people of the, the pro death side, objecting to um, the idea that the they would the abortion clinics would have to have a relationship with a funeral home yeah, that would yeah, take care know, of yeah. the, dispose mm -hmm. of the bodies. They don't want to do that because in many of these cases we know that they are selling body parts. Yeah, and right. that, so that's it, a fact. It is a fact. It's, yeah, we, we've known that for some time. Yeah, yeah you but hear a lot from the pro-death community. They say there's no evidence for that. You know, you're just speculating. That's Except for all the videos of But then you see the videos of it. Yeah, so it's, it's absolutely a fact. And, yeah. and there was just a case in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., yeah. Just, just a couple weeks ago. That. So, yep. There were hundreds of these, these children that were found. So lots of good Tragic. reasons to still keep on fighting, standing on God's truth and reclaiming that. And God does something amazing to change all this. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next article. Blind Mexican cave fish are developing cave-specific accents. It sounds fishy to so, me. So, uh... <laughs> you get better. That's probably the first time anybody's ever <laughs> laughed at your point. Uh, no. are, are you, you get better. Are you, are you offended by that? Are you offended? You say offended. offended. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't pull it off. The now my wife will be mad. You said a pun. Why'd you do that? Anyway, all right, so... Yeah. Basically, these fish are having different accents, if you will. They're using that term. Not like North versus South accent, Southern accent versus a Minnesotan accent or whatever. Not that. <laughs> that <would All>, right. <laughs> I know Minnesotans don't talk like that. I apologize. But anyway. <laughs> right, yeah, but sure, you betcha. <laughs> exactly. It's from Wisconsin. <laughs> so you know that Up north, right? <laughs> 
But in no, the underground I, caves of northeastern Mexico, we got groups of blind fish appear developing these different accents, and they're different clicks, and the clicks have different distinct uh, pitches to them in different areas, and so you have the variations of the blind cave fish, the ones with sight, mm-hmm. same fish, different variations, which is kind of unique. We have some of the blind cave fish actually at the Creation Museum, and one exhibit there showing variation, but they're still mm-hmm. fish. And so we're trying to figure out how did, how did this evolve into existence, what does this tell us about evolution and fish and so forth and so on. And it really tries to explain all this from the evolutionary worldview perspective. And I guess it's really not that surprising to find something like this. I mean, we would, if you think about the different dialects, the different accents that we have here in America, if we didn't have mass media, if we didn't have television, radio that reaches across the country, how long do you think it would take before somebody in Boston could no longer understand somebody in New Orleans? Because of how strong both those accents are, but how different they are. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would think within 50 to 100 years, they would, be, they would not be able to communicate very well. Be tough, there would be a yeah. completely different dialect, practically a different language. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have a standardized dictionary where you're spelling the words the same way, you're spelling it the way it sounds, yeah. pretty soon right, it's going right, to be a completely right. different language. And that's sort of what's going on here, but not, not at the same level. Yeah, they just have a, a different click or something. And <laughs> Who they hang out yeah. with. Different yeah, click. but maybe yeah. that's how we could, we could look at this. And I kind of felt bad, though, for the researchers. They said they had to analyze 44 hours of this fish chatter. Recorded in six different caves. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. I totally missed that. That was a long time. <laughs> I, I thought the, cave, the one of the caves was called like Subterraneo or something. I was like, yeah, really? That's all. That's what you're going to call a cave underground? I mean, that's, come on, be a little more original than that. And but the fact that fish can communicate at all is just a hallmark of God's design yeah, on absolutely. them. And yep. of course, that communication is limited. They're not doing, you know, they're not writing music or you know, doing mm-hmm. engineering plans. It's limited to their functionality. But it is a sign of their creation. But it, again, we are so distinct from the animals and our ability to communicate, how we can communicate the words we use, the inflections of our voices, what that means, the puns we can tell, the good or bad jokes. We're so unique in our ability to communicate at such a higher level. And that's all through words, through the body language, right. through oh, sign right. language, Absolutely. through facial expressions. I talk with through. my hands all the time. I can't help it. It just happens. Yeah. So... Hallmarks to God's design. That's awesome. Wish mm-hmm. we could stick Amen. on this article for a long time, but we got to go to the next one. Yeah, Unfortunately, can we go back? yeah. Can we just stay on that one? Students at Methodist Institution pray to Great Queer One. And so this is over at Duke. This uh, is a real title. This by is, the way. That's this a real is, title. This is real. It's at Duke Divinity School. By the way, I grew up in North Carolina, and I'm a Tar Heel fan, so I expect this from people who go to Duke. But anyway. <laughs> Oh, man. Wow. We're going to get out of here. Okay. Sorry. No, <laughs> I but think I heard a couple of amens out there. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Tar Heel fans. But <laughs> we're in Kentucky. There, they, there's a shared oh, hatred yeah, of Duke yeah, here. Yeah, it's yeah, very, very funny. true. Yeah. Uh, but basically what it is, there's a report coming out from the Duke Divinity School that students at Duke Divinity School, uh, mm-hmm. they have held what's called pride worship uh, to serve or pray to the great queer one. And so part of this is the Divinity of Pride student group who are affirming of dignity and faithfulness and strength of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, genosexuality, nonconforming Christians. I think I got all that that out. I know, right? And so they want to really redefine God in their own image. And, you know, oftentimes we say we don't see people carving idols like we did back in the day, but we do. This is... This is a group of people carving an idol of God in their own image. Mm -hmm. And they open with a prayer. That prayer started off like this. To the strange one, the fabulous one, fluid and ever becoming one, God is mother, father, parent, drag queen, trans man, and gender fluid. I think there's a problem with that. Um, So a couple things here that I want to talk about. Um, Yes, this, this, the idea that they're trying to make God in their own image. That's, we see this all the time. People who are engaged in a certain sinful behavior, who still want to hang on to belief in God, will often find verses or find some crazy ways to try to make the Bible say what they want it to say. And, and this <laughs> yeah, one, they yeah. came up with the craziest, the, the time yeah. that Jacob wrestled with God at night. Yeah, and, 32. And was, his hip was touched and changed. He had the limp afterwards. That's this change after the struggle that represents transgenderism. And then he got a new name. Yeah, and then he had a new name, Jacob. His name became Israel. Um, But one thing to to clarify here is that God does have attributes that encompass what humanity is, both masculine and feminine. God is caring in that way. But the people who are so big on making sure that you get to choose your own pronouns, God told us what his pronouns are in Scripture. He, him. 
Mm-hmm. Every it's, time. Um, masculine. Um, mm-hmm. But he still does have, I mean, women are made in God's image just as much as men are made in God's image. So there are, he does have attributes that, that women tend to have more of than men. Uh, oftentimes compassion and other, many God. other things Praise too. Uh, yeah. Much higher pain tolerance than we have and, um, <laughs> yeah, and many other absolutely. things. No um, argument from me. Yeah. 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 Uh, so just a few things to think about. Yeah, they're, they're misusing, abusing scripture to blaspheme God is what they're ultimately doing. And sadly, this is what a lot of people will get into when you allow um, man's ideas or when you allow your thinking to reinterpret what Scripture says rather than conforming our thinking to God's Word. And it's not just a danger for the people who are um, anti-God or people who are very far left. It's a danger for Christians as well. We, we all are prideful. And it's very easy for us to go to Scripture, try to find what we want it to say, and pull a verse out of context. We have to be very careful to interpret it in light of its context and pay close attention to the wording that is there and change our thinking and conform with it rather than the other way around. Yep, yep, absolutely. And like, like Tim was saying, this is nothing new. I mean, this is even though this modern version should really just stun us, of course, this has been happening ever since the fall, right? People make up gods in their own in their own whatever suits them so they can have that sinful lifestyle they can hold on to it they want to have a god that kind of comports with whatever sexual ethics that they have here and that's basically what we're seeing here today it's a violation of the first and second commandments you guys remember those ones right no other god before me do not make for yourself an idol but i just kept thinking we need roger's heresy flag for this one i know i mean, wish just, we got a problem yeah oh I, man. i'm not sure if it's big but, enough i think you need a couple yeah, of them for this this yeah there's this a lot is, of problems this is just complete but, i mean heresy but there's the nothing new through. i've been showing articles like this yeah. in one of my presentations about who jesus is but for years where there's a you know saying that jesus was the first transgender mm-hmm. saying that jesus was homosexual saying i mean they're yeah. basically whatever you want him to be that's what they're making him so that they can try to justify their own behavior um, and it's really kind of strange to me uh, for people who have really no desire to yield to uh, what God has said in his word uh, why do they even care because ultimately it's just deceived they're, they're, it's deception they're deceived into believing these things and then they're trying to push it on others. They're trying to force this ideology on others and mm-hmm. pretend as if they're being good Christians. Well, I'm sorry, anytime we're twisting God's word, we're not being good Christians. And well, of again, course, it's something we all have to be careful about. We do, and so, they want to force that ideology because they want others to actually agree with them, mm-hmm. agree with me that, my, and that my sin, them. and celebrate that my yeah. sin is okay. Yeah. Why? Because it's ultimately Romans chapter 1, a suppressing of truth. I don't want any reminder that what I'm doing is wrong and unbiblical. I need to be affirmed again and again that it is right. Therefore, it's not enough that you allow me to live my life, but rather you must affirm and celebrate it. Therefore, I feel Mm -hmm. like it is okay. It's another part of suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because in reality, they're made in God's image. And the truth Mm -hmm. is inside of them welling up, trying to tell them again and again, this is wrong according to God's standard. They're suppressing Mm -hmm. that, and that's part of the equation. According to God's word, that's what we need to remember. Man's word versus God's word. That's every time, down to. every time. And then speaking of the gender issue and so forth, a bit of positive news, a kind of a different angle. Professor was punished for refusing to use preferred pronouns. He sued and then just settled for four hundred thousand dollars. Just four hundred. Just four hundred. All right. Yeah. yeah, not bad. That's it's good news. It really is, and we yeah. should celebrate it while we can. Uh, but at Shawnee State University, a professor refu- refused to use the preferred pronouns of a male student who identifies as a female. And so the student went to the professor and evidently was not very kind in how the student encouraged the professor uh, to use their preferred pronouns and, yep. you know, maybe even threatened violence to one degree or another. They'll very call the professor language. names, mm-hmm. right? And then went to the, the governing body of the university, and then the university sided with the student and said, told the professor, you must use this student's preferred pronouns. Bear in mind, the professor had actually said, you know what, tell you what, I won't call you by a particular pronoun, I'll just call you by your last name. How about that, right? So well, not that wasn't good enough she, because if he's not going to do that for every other student, then this student's being singled still out. Still feel so. singled out. So yeah. they said it wasn't good enough, and then eventually he was let go over it, and he refused to do it because he said it does not line up with his religious beliefs that we are made in God's image. God made us male and female. Right? That's not so, just a religious belief. I mean, it is, but it's also scientific. Well, yeah. it's, it's I mean, been the, common it's, sense. In terms of people being male, male or female. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We're not biologists. We can't define women, remember <laughs> But well, you're not an English major, so you can't use English right. anymore. So that means no more puns. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, man. Uh, quick. All right. That's a good one. That was pretty sharp, all right? And so, but anyway, he took it to court, and then eventually going through multiple lower courts up to a higher court, they actually sided with him. Well, mm-hmm. they didn't really side. The, the university agreed to actually settle out of court because they most likely realized they weren't going to win this. And he got his position back, and they've actually agreed to let him 
speak how he wants to speak about pronouns. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely call that a win. And it should just be another reminder that uh, this LGBT community, this ideology is not neutral, right? And it's they not. they don't want just tolerance. They want, like we were saying in the last ar article, right. they want celebration, utter and complete celebration, of course. And they're always talking about discrimination, but who are they actually discriminating against in this case? Of course, it's anyone that holds a to a biblical worldview, a Christian belief, of course. So you see that double standard mm -hmm. over and over again. But you know, and, and similar to the way we talked about the one earlier with the person running for Congress right now, there we need to have a sensitivity toward these people. And we're talking about what they're doing is sinful, and it is. Mm -hmm. And the ide ideology that they're pushing is poisonous. But they're still individuals made in God's image. They're yep. people who are worth pursuing with the gospel message. Yep. And, and we need to love these people, not uh, you know beat them over the head with things, not mock them or make fun of them. It, it, it's it is something point. that they're people who are, generally speaking, truly hurting. And mm -hmm. they have all sorts of, of, of you know, cases of depression and all sorts of other uh, issues going on are so much higher in the, that lifestyle, if I can call it that, in that community. Mm. Um, so if, as Christians, we need to, again, be tenderhearted and, and reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and that's really the most loving thing we can do. The, the really loving is. thing is not to just affirm their sin. The loving thing is to point them to Christ, right? Because once you are set free by the Son, you will be free indeed. And that's what we need to do. But to do that in a loving way. Absolutely. Because some, sometimes we're not always the most tactful yeah. or loving. We, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things I really love about this ministry we're blessed to be a part of, and we're so glad you guys are here or watching online, but this ministry focus as we do apologetics, which means to defend the faith, we don't simply give these answers simply to win arguments or debates. We're giving these answers to defend biblical authority, to proclaim the gospel effectively. That's the heartbeat behind all this. We give answers to proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we understand if we can convince someone that our argument is right and true, that does not save them. And what they need is a heart change. And so we give answers to get rid of their excuses they're raising up to the gospel, to clear a path for the gospel, that God might change their heart through all that and bring salvation to them. And so what we seek to do is equip mm -hmm. Christians to, yes, know what you believe and why, on any issue, origin, sexuality, morality, stand on God's word to give an answer, but to give that in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in an effective manner in our secular culture. We highly encourage you to do that. We love doing that and love the heartbeat of our ministry because that's what it is. Preach yeah. it. Amen. 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 Yeah. Well, we got to wrap up with the last article. Yeah. Fun one, evolutionists. The eye is close to perfect. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, why is this even news? Yeah. Oh, because for so long, exactly. Now, the evolutionists have always said, "Oh, the human eye is wired backwards, and yeah. if it was just yeah. like the octopus right. has right. a much better eye, right?" Yeah. So, yeah. If how, you many, how, follow how, how many times have we heard that? You guys remember that in school that the human eye is backwards and the octopus has a much yeah. better eye? Well, maybe they're not creation apologetic junkies <laughs> like we are, but if you followed like the creation evolution debate for <laughs> a number like, of years now, and they're like, "What?" <laughs> That's they, what they teach. Evolutionists yeah, have argued for a long time that our eyes are poorly designed, that human eyes are eyes are poorly designed. Mm -hmm. That things like octopuses, cephalopods have much better designed eyes because of the way it's wired, it gets to light more directly and so forth. And they say, hey, our eyes are wired backwards. Their argument was, since our eyes are wired backwards according to them, therefore it's a bad design, therefore could not be a designer, therefore evolution must be true. That's a terrible argument for evolution, number one. I wonder what Filled they, I wonder what they use fallacies. to see the... The makeup of the eye. To see it? I think oh, they were no, probably yeah. using their eyes they that were, were well designed. Might be well good designed. Guess. Yeah, might be good that's guess. my guess. And so, to make this short and condensed, basically, what they're now admitting is these couple of scientists who believe revolutionists are saying, wow. Now that we better understand the human eye, it looks like it's really well designed. <laughs> Engineered, they even say. Wow. Yeah. Look at all the jaws dropping. I know you're just yeah. shocked. It's designed to do what it does yeah. do. What it does do, it does do well, well right? Yes, yes, it does. Buddy Finally, Davis says it. <laughs> us and the evolutionists, we can see eye to high. Oh, oh wow. Right? I mean, it's... <laughs> I'm turning wow. off the mic. <laughs> wow. Man alive. He's just full of them today. Right? Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah, he's just... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so it's really, I mean, this is what we expect from a biblical worldview. Real science confirms the Bible again yeah. and again. And when we lack understanding about something, give it time. The more mm -hmm. we rightly understand it, it will confirm what we read in God's Word. And by the way, yeah, this, is a, this. this is a great job of actually studying the eye rather than just making these mm -hmm. wild assumptions yeah. about it. They actually studied the, the human eye, the cephalopod eye, and others as well and said, no, these... 
they're designed perfectly for where they are and what they are supposed to do. Yeah, we see this over and over again with all the, you know, junk DNA. Why did God design it this way? This isn't the perfect creation. But then lo and behold, years later, they're discovering how perfectly designed it was. And this is just another example of and, that. And there wasn't junk DNA after all. Yeah, it exactly. It's, yeah. It's, you see this month after month. And at the very end, it says this. They said, in terms of performance, vertebrate eyes, our eyes, come close to perfect. Wow, imagine that. Remember, that also includes, they talked about how that includes like eagles and hawks to vertebrate eyes yeah, um, yeah they don't have bad eyesight <laughs> not at all a couple of resources i want to point you to first of all if you're mm -hmm. curious about some of those old arguments for evolution those classical iconic arguments for evolution how to debunk those great book on that called glass house going through i think 40 different iconic arguments for evolution and just utterly debunking them at a scientific level at a biblical level so well done I encourage you to check that book out yeah. and then of course we talked a lot about the gender issues and sexuality issues got a whole book on that called the gender and marriage war mm -hmm. gives you really good biblical answers to all those issues that are so prevalent in our culture today. And then I want to just mention very quickly as we wrap up here for today, Day of Latino. It's a special event we have in October for the Spanish-speaking community. It's an awesome event throughout the museum and the Ark Encounter. If you have connections to that community, invite them. Let them know. It's going to be an awesome time it here is. for it's that. It is. It's a lot of fun. So yeah. much fun. Yeah. And then the last thing we'll plug before we wrap up for today, the College Expo. We have coming mm -hmm. up in November 3rd through 5th. A bit of ways, but if you got a kid who's getting close to going to college, even a freshman in high school or sophomore, still bring them. We bring in a lot of Christian colleges who are taking a firm stand on biblical authority from the beginning. And by the way, many, if not most, Christian colleges are not taking that stand. So we're kind of weeding out some of the some of the bad stuff, some of the bad colleges are not good options, and giving you some of the best ones right here at one spot, like a one-stop shopping area for a good Christian college. So I encourage you to come for any of those. It's going to Absolutely. be a good time for all that. So much more happening here at the ministry, but God's doing awesome things through Answers in Genesis. We praise Him for that. We, we are glad you're here, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care. God bless.